2 Timothy chapter 3, please. And we'll read the entire chapter. It's not a very long chapter. It's only 17 verses. So if you could read along with me, and then we'll sing another hymn after. But when you're there, we'll start in verse 1. We'll read the 17 verses that's found in chapter 3. And it reads, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was but thou hast fully known my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long-suffering charity patience persecutions afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Amen. Praise the Lord, we have a Bible. We have the word of God, which we can hold in our hands. Praise the Lord. I don't know how thankful you are for that, but I'm very thankful. Many a times I, I just, I got saved nearly, nearly 10 years ago now. In a couple of months it will be. The Lord saved me 10 years ago. That was when I was 21 years old and he saved me. And then I was drawn to the word because I wanted to know what God said. I wanted to know who he was. And you cannot know who the Lord Jesus is without the scriptures. You cannot know. You'll find another Jesus preached. You'll find another Jesus held somewhere else. And there's many that are portrayed in the world, isn't there? And there's two things that the Lord has given us. His words and the spirit of God. And by both, we know to fellowship with one another. And we know how to serve God through both. And then I was speaking to my son yesterday. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. Not pictures not other people teaching or feelings or perhaps experience. The words are what Christians should live by every day. Every word of God shall man live. And we'll get a little bit more into that. But if you just look down in verse 1 of chapter 3. Look down. The second word in that verse is this. This no. This no. This popped out to me several times. That Timothy was informed very, very well. He had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. He'd come across the apostle Paul himself, as well as the other disciples they interacted with, traveled. He was familiar with the different churches throughout Asia and Grecia. But listen to what he says. He says, this know also. Timothy, I need you to know this. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. A certainty in the last days I mean, if they thought they were living in the last days in the first century, we certainly 
are in the last, last days. And what shall come in those last days? Perilous times. Dangerous times, confusing times, troublesome times. Perilous times shall come. And it gives us a list. It even tells us what men will be like in those last days. It gives us a list. Look, look down in verse 2. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Have you seen such a self-centered generation or even heard of such a generation that are so consumed with themselves? I haven't seen and my research in history didn't say there are some that are likened unto it. But this generation is the most self-centered, self-loving generation that I believe we've ever come across. And it goes on, it's covetous, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. You, can you see such disobedience in the day and age we live in? To parents, to any authority, lack of respect. And it says, the generation in the last days, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. It even goes down and says, they're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And it says they have a form of godliness. You know, every generation, every religion, everyone, even people that kill other people, they always think it's good in their own eyes, of course. Jesus even warned and said, people shall put you to death and think they're doing God a service. You know that Adolf Hitler, that wicked wretch of a man that caused the whole world to go into an entire war. It cost the lives of millions of people and the after effects that it produced that he believed that he was doing good out of all the wickedness that he portrayed and promoted and even caused. They always think they're doing good, but it says this, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, they do not know God. We live in a generation today, this year, 2023, we live in a generation that does not know God. They think they're good in their own eyes, don't they? You don't have to walk too far down the street or past Chesham or Beaconsfield, wherever the case, people think they're good. People think this generation is the best generation that has ever set foot on the planet. They think they're good in their own eyes, but they deny the power thereof. That means they, they don't believe that there is such a thing as a resurrection. They don't believe there is such a thing as a God. But look what it tells us to inform us. From such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Everyone looks away. This is a warning to us to sleeping Christians, to laxy, lazy Christians. Those who are not aware, that are not awake, they're going to be led astray. Why? Because many, many is the word, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many. It doesn't say a few. It doesn't say a few deceivers left. Even one of the 12 disciples was a false disciple, was he not? He was a traitor. He was a liar. It said that he was a devil from the beginning, Jesus said. Even one of the 12 that was in the company of Jesus for over three years, he even managed to infiltrate. But it says about these people in verse 7, they're ever learning and never able to come to what? The knowledge of the truth. And that, that's, that's us today as Christians. We are people, we have been brought to the knowledge of the truth. Can you believe it? Just, just fix your mind on that. We have come to the knowledge of the truth. Out of many things, I, I saw this word, no, 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 knowledge, over and over again in this chapter, that Timothy knew, that where he knew it from, who he knew. And then he, all these things that he know, but then it speaks of the lost, that they, they were unable to come to the knowledge of, you have come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a precious thing to have. And it continues on, it says this, but they shall proceed no further, and it, uh, in verse eight, sorry, and it says, it names two men, Janus and Jambres. These are two men that withstood Moses. And many to believe these to be um, of a priesthood that was found in Egypt. We're not given any names in the book of Exodus that um, counteracted Moses, that opposed him. But it gives us two names here that Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. Just as those wicked men, they withstood Moses. It says this, so do these also resist the truth. We are going to come across people that are going to resist the truth. They think that they have a form of godliness. They think they're good. They think they have it. But they resist the truth. They resist it. That means they shut a door against it. And it says that men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And they shall proceed no longer. But look at verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, Timothy. Now, Timothy was someone who was very, very aware of who Paul was, what Paul was saying, where he said it. Now, as Christians, we ought not to be ignorant people. In fact, we should be the most diligent people that people can find on the planet. 
He said, you have fully known my doctrine, Timothy. You've known my manner of life, my purpose. What was Paul's purpose? Can most Christians tell you today? What was his manner of life? Who was he? Most people wouldn't be able to tell you that Paul was a Roman citizen. He used to be a Pharisee. He put people to death before he was converted. Did you know that? But he said, Timothy, you know all these things. And he says this, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, persecutions, afflictions. And he knew where it happened. He knew who Paul was. And also this, he knew who the Lord Jesus was. He knew him. He wasn't anyone who was slack in studying the scriptures either. And it says, all the things that I endured, but out of them, the Lord delivered me from them all. But look at the word there in that verse. Look at the word in verse 11. He says, in, sorry, in verse 10, thou hast fully known my doctrine. That's singular. Timothy, you have fully known all of these things. And I believe it is of the utmost importance that Christians, they know what they believe. If you should have ever known what you believe, if you ever should know what the scriptures say it should be today, we have no excuse. I have a Bible app on my phone. I can put in any word on my Bible app. It will show me every time it's mentioned in the scriptures. I can put phrases, terminology. I can do it just at the click of a finger. I can know what the words are just, just on a phone. I have loads of Bibles in my house. Now, we are not sure of the scriptures in the day and age we live in. We are not sure. That means we are without excuse. We are without excuse. We should not be ignorant concerning the word of God. Just go one chapter back. I'd like you to just look at this. This is 2 Timothy 2.15. Again, Timothy, the individual, he says, you need to know this. And he says, and you've fully known all of these things. And look at this. Just in the previous chapter, it says this. Look at it. Most people memorize this verse. It's a very popular verse. 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm sure if you nodded your heads, you would have heard of that verse. But look what it says. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Singular. Not make sure the church is well rehearsed. Make sure that the Bible is preached. And I do believe the Bible should be preached in churches. And it, it, it informs us to do many things with the word of God. But three of them are this. We are instructed and commanded to read the word. Read the word of God. We're also instructed to meditate on the word of God. You know what that means? We read it and then we reflect upon it. We just think and dwell upon it and meditate on that word. It's almost like, you know, like when you, you might even start to chew on something for a while and then you get more flavor the longer you chew on it. So we're supposed to do that. Read, meditate, and it also says this in verse 15, and to study. Study what to do what? To show yourself approved unto God. Does God approve of your walk, of your study, of your learning? Does God approve of what you do with your life? Does God approve of your laziness in regards to reading the word? This is, look here, this is the most read book of all time. The most purchased, the most handled book of all time. But it's like a flip side coin. This is also the most neglected book ever to appear on the earth, isn't it? The Bible has sat on many a shelf, gathered much dust in Christian homes, in churches. What a shame. But if you look down, keep on reading with me in chapter 3. It says that this is what drew me to preach this message. It's this in verse 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They shall. We do know as... The day of Christ approaches as we enter into these last days. The days will get darker, Christian. We know that, don't we? And this is a clear chapter about it. We know, and evil, evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and themselves being deceived. That will happen. What do we do about that? The world's going to get worse and worse, Christian. You know what we should do? Just kind of hang tight, tuck in a bit more, and then we'll get through it. No, 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 no. The next verse tells us, Yes, the world will get darker, but continue thou. Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them. You know what gives me encouragement? I go out to the world, I go to work, I, I do these things. I live in the same world you do. I'm not naive. I'm not up in a Christian monastery or palace somewhere and I have no interaction with the world. No, no, no. I have the same flesh, the same wars you do. I live in the same wicked world that you do. I know how dark it is, but what do I do? 
What, what is going to drive me and you? What is going to encourage us? What is going to get us by day to day being in this world but not of this world? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of. If you haven't learnt anything, you're not going to be assured of anything. And you're, not, you're definitely not going to be able to continue. You're going to be stumped day in, day out. You step out of your door. You're confronted with temptation. You receive persecution. Hard times come. You can't handle the darkness around you and you start to crumble. There's no way you'd be able to continue unless you've learned first and then been assured. When I, whenever I read, I know that it's from God. And I'm sure you can relate to that. You read the scriptures and you know this is bulletproof. The foundation which we stand on the word of God is unshakable and unbreakable. And it should edify you, strengthen you, give you such confidence that we know what we believe and we know this is true. And we shouldn't be ashamed to be able to show it. And he says this, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. How did Timothy first come to the knowledge of the truth? It says in, in the book of Acts that he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother, Lois and Eunice. So he, he knew where his faith came from. And we should be able to look back and see we have a great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us. We should know where our Bible has come from, by the way. Go to the book of Deuteronomy very quickly with me, if you can. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Thank you. And when you get there, go to chapter 17. This is very important. You might have read over this. You might be familiar with this. But Deuteronomy, fifth book in the Bible. Go to chapter 17. And I'll share this with you very, very briefly. It says this. And then we'll look in uh, verse 18. It speaks about, God gives them warning. He says, if you choose yourself a king to rule over you. That wasn't his intention at first anyway. But he says, if you choose yourself a king, that means that king cannot multiply wives to himself. That king cannot go and get horses from Egypt. He's not supposed to multiply gold. He's not supposed to do this, that and the other. And then we know of a great king that did every single one of those things that was told not to be done. And that would be King Solomon. But look in verse 18. This was God speaking directly. If there's a king, if there's a leader that is propped up amongst you, in verse 18 it says, It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. Look this way, everyone. You know what the king in the Old Testament was commanded to do? He's supposed to get a copy of the book of the law and write out a copy for himself. He's supposed to have his own copy that he penned down with his own hand. And I believe this would be very, very helpful for us because he would have looked down. He would have seen his own handwriting. He would have seen the, the own smudges and everything that would have come from him penning down that book. He would have known where that book came from. He would have known what went into that and he would have known the commandment that he was given. Sometimes we hold a, I know we have a printed Bible nowadays with leather skin and everything like that and ribbons and nice pieces of paper and maps. But sometimes we approach the word and we have no idea or appreciation of where it came from or why we even have it. The king would have known the Lord wanted me to read this. When? Every day. And look in 19. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Is that just when he's king? That's when he reads the book every day? No, no, no. All the days of his life. And where's it supposed to be? In the palace? The king goes to the temple every day. No, no. It says, the book shall be with him. I'll show you a godly king. Someone who has a Bible with them. Someone who understands what they read. And they read it every day. Why, why would that be beneficial for a king? Why would that be beneficial for us to read the word every day and have it with us? Not have it in your home. To have it with you means you possess this word. Because one day, if they take this away from me, I ought to still be able to possess it in my heart. It continues on, it says this, why, why would it be fitting for him to do that? To have it with him, to read it, why? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. And it also says this in, in verse 20, look carefully, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Now I've read books in my time, I hated reading growing up. I hated reading, you couldn't give me a book. I've, I'd, I'd say, give me a film, give me a movie to watch, something of the sort. I was such a TV-headed guy, but I read a lot now. I read books. 
And then um, I'll quote one to you very shortly uh, in an application, of course, that's uh, not a biblical book or a Christian book, a history book. But I love reading. I love learning as much as I can. But as the scriptures say, knowledge puffeth up, doesn't it? Like the more, and the more you learn, it's almost like the more downcast you feel because you, you learn more of evil, you learn more truths that weren't ever uncovered. But it says this, if you read the Bible every day, are you getting puffed up? No, 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 no. If he reads the Bible every day, he'll learn not for his heart not to be lifted up above his brethren. It was not so, I'm the king here, I read the Bible, I know what it said. No, 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 no. He wouldn't be lifted up above his brethren. And if we in the New Testament today, if God, if the Lord Jesus has made us kings and priests unto our God, we have a New Testament, we have 66 books before us that the king didn't have in his day, how much more responsibility do we have for this word to be with us and read every day that we not be lifted up, that we not be puffed up? Go back to 2 Timothy if you could. Very important that we read this, that we know it all the days of our lives. Not so that we'd just be filled with doctrine, not that just we'd be filled with information or facts, biblical facts, but that we would be able to walk humbly with our God. That's God's desire and intention for us. Yes, we know that the world is an evil place. We know that. Yes, we know that dark times shall come and things shall get worse. We know that. But what do we do? We continue in the things that we have learned and been assured of. And it says even from a child, Timothy knew the scriptures. Did you know that? Some of you have children, some of you have grandchildren, they should know the scriptures. We shouldn't ever look at children or give them the impression that they cannot know what the word says or they cannot know God himself. In fact, children are so tender. I love children because they ask all the questions. That, you ever think of those questions? You meet a new believer, they ask all sorts of questions and, and it's good. I normally meet people ask more questions in January than any other time of year because they started reading their Bible. They went on a Bible reading plan and then they're asking questions. And it's good. Those questions shouldn't fall off because the reading shouldn't fall off, of course. But I love that children ask questions. Children are so curious. Children are so humble. And they're so dependent. And that's why we should show them the scriptures. Because from a child, they are able to be wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I think it's over 80% of professing Christians were converted when they were children, or converted under the age of 16, as it were. Over 80% of Christians were converted before they were an adult. That should tell us something, that we can reach children, and there is a generation coming up that do not know God, and they sure need, they sure need him. There's so much going on in the world, they need him now more than ever. But in verse 16, this is a very, very famous, popular verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable when we read the bible is it ever unprofitable is it ever vain is it ever a waste of time let me let me just tell you something let me be honest with you i have never regretted spending any time in the word now many times i've gone to pray and, and everything everything in this world everything in me was fighting against it not to pray not to be on my knees not to push everything aside and just be alone with god i had so much fighting me and continuously do I've never regretted a time that I spent in prayer. And again, I've never, ever regretted a time that I went to the word. Whether that was just quickly, whether that was just to confirm something, or in my daily reading, I've never regretted it because it was never unprofitable. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why would God do this? Why would God give us a word that would be profitable in all these things? Look at verse 17. I think normally this verse is skipped over. It says this, that the man of God may be perfect. You know what that means? Complete. We shouldn't have broken Christians everywhere. We shouldn't have Christians with loose ends everywhere and churches that don't know where they stand. The word has been given for us so that we can be complete, that we can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know what that means? If you see a building like this building here and we took out all the furniture... All the chairs, everything from the coat hangers to every table to every pen and pencil. We took it all out. It's just void, isn't it? It's void and empty. Is your Christian life like that? Is it well furnished? Because it should be. And how can you be thoroughly furnished unto all good works? By the word of God. 
Now, I think that if the word of God is taken out of the hands, hearts and minds of Christians, we are powerless. We are like soldiers without a weapon. And I read, let me just briefly give you a story. I read this and I found some parallels in this. I thought, unbelievable. I think, I'm sure I probably won't do a good job, but I thought that there's a message in there somewhere and that will preach. Eh, who here, if, if you just like look this way, you've heard of Napoleon Bonaparte before. I'm sure you've heard of him before, haven't you? Yeah. This man, he, he tore, you know, so much war and battles. He, he tore a lane through Europe, as it were, just through his battles. I believe in modern warfare, modern warfare, he has more victories in battle than any other commander. He didn't win every war, though, but he has more victories in battle, as it were, that's counted to him. Now, I'm sure you've heard of a, a battle in 1805 called the Battle of Austerlitz. That happened in uh, Czechoslovakia. This was considered to be his greatest victory in 1805. He was a young commander. He had less troops, less supplies, less of a force, less firepower to fight off the Austrian Empire and the Russian Empire that had allied together against France, against Napoleon's Franco army. And even the British were supporting the Russians and the Austrians to crush this French general that had been coming up. And then before he got to the Battle of Austerlitz, before this great victory that actually turned everything, before this happened, he had to cross a bridge called the Tabor Bridge, which was at a place called Spitz in Austria. And that would have been crossing uh, the River Danube, the Danube River. This very, very large river, famous river that runs through Europe. And then in order to cross the Danube River, he had to cross the Tabor Bridge. There was no other way. In order to engage in the battle, in order to get victory, he had to cross this bridge at this location of Spitz. You know what was commanded of the Austrian troops? There was a commander called Count Augsburg. He was a general, he was a commander of the Austrian troops who were over the other side of the bridge. They're over the other side of the river. His command was this, simple, blow the bridge. So his army, he got his troops to fuse the bridge, ready to blow the bridge. Napoleon, he was a crafty fellow, crafty. He was like a fox in war. And he also had a few commanders. One was Morat and one was Lan. And then these are two of um, Napoleon's commanders. And it says this about these commanders. They approach the bridge. Before they blow the bridge, they walk over the bridge. Two of Napoleon's commanding officers. They walk over the bridge as bold as anything. They walk over the bridge and they say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And then they go to the troops and one of the men, one of the commanders, the French men, he leans on one of their cannons as the other commander is speaking to these Austrian troops. He says, um, excuse me, fellas, don't worry, no need to blow the bridge. An armistice has been signed, a peace treaty between the Austrians and the French. An armistice has been signed. We're not going to engage in warfare with you today. But in the armistice, the bridge belongs to France. And there's no need for anyone to die today. We can all go home. And then they call their, they call their general, Count Asperg. And he comes, he says, right, right. And they convince him that an armistice has been signed. A peace treaty has been signed. No one has to die today. And he says, well, right oh, that's certainly right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Come on in, troops, let's pack up. No armistice was signed. No peace treaty was signed. All he had to do was blow the bridge. One command, very clear, take the bridge away. If the bridge was taken away, they wouldn't have been able to cross the Danube. They could have lost supplies, lost men. And historians look back and believe there would have been no further Napoleonic wars in the way that there was if Napoleon wouldn't have crossed that bridge that day. You know what cost them? It wasn't necessarily stupidity. It was laziness. Not following the orders that were given cost them many men, cost them much time, much aggravation. And I believe this is like us today. You know what the devil does? He comes into our churches, infiltrates in whichever way he does through people. And you know what they do? They say, uh, no, no, we don't need this anymore. We don't. As bold as you like, they'll go to the pulpit and lean on it like this, like he did with the cannons. And he'll say, no, 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 we don't need this anymore. This is outdated. This belongs in a museum. Preaching from this in the 21st century. Are you mad? This isn't true. Can you, know, can you believe this today? Really? Do you believe everything? Do you believe that God created the heaven and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh? Really? This? If the devil can take your weapon away from you, how are you supposed to fight back? As bold as anything, we see it and churches being turned upside down. And then we can finally say that which is evil is being called that which is good. And that which is good is being called that which is evil. 
Can you believe such boldness in order to turn a whole army? You'd think that's ignorant, that is. We have a generation of ignorant Christians today. If I was you, I would go home, ask God to help me in any way I can, not to be ignorant, not to cost the body any more casualty, that you would go home and learn and know the things that you ought to know and where you've learned them. It's of utmost importance for us. If we do not do that, what do we do for the next generation? Some of us look today and we think, well, the previous generation failed us. That's why the mess we're in. Look at it. You believe this? Call this a Christian country? Why are there so many empty churches everywhere? It's their fault. No, no, no. We have a responsibility today. God has given us life, breath today to serve him in 2023. And that we might be able to pass it on to the next generation. In the first century, the days were very bad for Christians. But Paul still passed it on to Timothy. And Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. If you do not know what the scriptures say... You'll be deceived. Mark my words, you will by all means be deceived. The devil, he's a crafty fellow. We have an enemy that knows more than we know. He's been around for longer than we have. And he has deceived bigger, stronger, much more mature men than us. How are we to stand? We stand upon the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. If we don't do this, we will fall. We certainly will. We'll allow him to deceive us. And then we'll look back and think, how did, how did that happen? All it was, one bridge, just one had to be blown. How did all this chaos happen? And we'll look back and we think, yeah, that morning I neglected my Bible. That morning I neglected my Bible. I skipped church that day. I didn't fellowship that day. I, I stopped praying. I stopped walking with God. All those little steps are counted into utter terror and catastrophe. And we are reaping what we've sown. May we stand up and do that which is right and good in the eyes of God. And it, it, as he said, you'll be throughly furnished unto all good works. Will you not? That's a certainty if you know what the word of God says. And if you are throughly furnished unto all good works, Jesus said they shall see your good works and glorify who? You'll glorify my father in heaven. That's not just us. That's the people that will see us. They shall glorify our father in heaven. And may we actually be willing to be used by God Willing to learn, willing to be fully furnished. Sometimes that, that, the case is like this. Who, I, I'm sure you probably have grandchildren, children, or even yourself at one point. You got too many sweets one day, or maybe too much chocolate, whatever the case. You really gorged out on some biscuits, and then an hour later, tea time comes. I remember I went to the shop, and I, sweet, sweet, sweets, and like ice blast. They're like a kind of sugar-filled ice drink. And then all these other things, and some chocolates. And then a load of fizzy drinks on top of it. And then I got home. I couldn't eat a single thing. I was so full of junk. I was so full of that which is unhealthy and rotten. I couldn't enjoy a good meal. I think you ought to ask God to reveal to you those furnishings that are in your house, as it were, as a Christian. So it might need to be purged so that you can be truly furnished. You might need to be purged so that you can actually enjoy something that comes from the word of God. Or are you so full of junk that the world has brought in? what you're listening to, what you're looking at. I hope that you'll take heed after today because this is a stern warning, not just for you, but for me. If I neglect to read the word, I'll fall. If I presume to know what to do when a time of trouble comes, I'll fall. There's a reason why God commands us every day to read the word of God. Solomon fell. There was no need for him to fall. All he had to do was go to Deuteronomy 17 and know what it said. I'm sure if he read the Bible frequently, he would have come across that. But he didn't. And he was wiser, more noble than any of us. And he fell. May God give us the ability to learn the hunger to seek his face and the love of the word of God. Don't neglect your Bible, Christian. You're nothing without it. You won't be able to stand without it. And may God give us grace. May he give us more opportunities. May he even replenish us more the, the, the days that we've lost and cost him. May he give us more in the future. Restore unto us the, the years that the locusts have torn up and crunched away as it were. I was reading a biography of a lady called Amy Carmichael. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She was a missionary to India. And she come across a man called Thomas Walker. And a quote that he had was, Let us build for the years we shall not see. And these were, these were people that were ministering in India, an ungodly place. 
And then they were ministering there. But he said, let us build for the years that we shall not see. So if we continue, if we continue, God will do great things. And if we feel like we can't do much ourselves, let us disciple, let us teach, let us edify other people that they might be able to continue to. And God bless you as you do that. And I'm sure you'll be able to stick around for a bit of fellowship now.